From the creators of the iconic Notes of Bloodborne Explained comes a new series, Runes of Bloodborne, on patreon.com slash Sinclair Lore. Hi, Richie. Hi, Sin. We have a very special guest with us today. Who is it? Who are you, special guest? Uh, I appear often as Agent Funk, but you can just call me Alex for this. Okay. Hi, Alex! Welcome! Thank you. Alex has been, like, uh, a long-time Snap Covenant member. I think, I mean, I was checking it out even before the official Snap Covenant <laughs> started. Oh, yeah, you were there during the time of the classics. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I don't remember which one I came in first, but it was uh, the one about the doll, maybe, or something like that. We had, like, three about the doll. Was it just Richie and I? Richie, Michaela, and I? Richie, Jeremy, and I? <laughs> no. <laughs> I think it was just you and you and Richie, and it was, uh, what, a couple hours? Something like that. Sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. And, uh, Alex, is there anywhere where people can find you online? I have... A Twitter that has maybe like 20 followers if you want to look at it, but it's pretty boring. Okay, Alex, Alex, Alex. Yes. You gotta speak with more confidence. You gotta be like, I have a Twitter. You gotta check it out. Yeah, hype, energy, subscribe, smash that like button, you know? <laughs> well, I was looking it up because I couldn't even remember the name of it. <laughs> um, it uh, and I have 27 followers. Actually, I was wrong. Um, it's at Ultra Alex 78 But I don't do much with it. And I think that's the only online presence I really have. Okay. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> okay. So, Richie. Yes. What are we talking about today? We are talking about the SNES game EVO Search for Eden. Yay! And we streamed this uh, last week, sometime. Um, last Saturday. Or yeah, Saturday? yeah. We streamed this. We streamed this about a week ago. You didn't know anything about it, so I walked you through it with an infinite Evo points code, which I guess we'll go into later on. But that made the thing go much, much faster but probably didn't get at how tedious the grinding can get. Hmm. Hmm. And uh, Evo Search for Eden is an action like side-scroller? Uh, side-scrolling RPG, yeah. Side-scrolling RPG. Mm-hmm. And it was released in 92 in Japan and 93 in North America? Yep. Oh, man, we had to wait a whole year? It's actually not that long for that time period. Yeah, I'll, yeah, no, I remember. Um, we were like Australia was still getting SNES games in like 1998. Like that's how slow it was. <laughs> Is it because they had to translate the games upside down? Yes. <laughs> that and any like cultural stuff, you know, if there's something that might be offensive, that's not offensive to a Japanese audience. Or oh, just just something as basic as distributors weren't picking it up was also a big deal. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Alex, can you tell us about your experience with yeah. Evo? Uh, I remember, it's funny because like, I don't, I never actually owned this game, but it was one of those that I rented so many times that I probably should have just bought a copy. Mm-hmm. It would have been cheaper, ultimately. <laughs> it's also funny because uh, as much as I played it, I actually never knew how to turn into a human by the end and so i never actually saw that until years later when uh, mm-hmm. you could go on youtube and whatnot and watch that stuff so what did you turn into in the end um usually by the end i was like a rhinoceros lion thing or something. <laughs> <laughs> sounds way cooler than a human well, i would i thought so yeah if you're gonna populate you know, yeah future race giant rhino Lion men things or something a lot cooler. (laughs) I had a similar experience. I rented this game a lot. 
and uh, I never finished it. Because I, I would rent it, and then I, I wouldn't rent it consistently, so by the time I got it back again, like I my save files wouldn't be on the cartridge anymore. And um, my, like, we were talking about humans, and, like, the manual, I remember, it listed all of the different evolutions in it. Um, like, what all the different parts did. Because in-game, in when you evolve a part, you're just given the name of it, and then you have to, like, evolve it and check your stats to see what the changes are. But the manual did have, like, a list of what they all did. And I remember looking at the mammal section, which is where the human was, and it had, like, manes and horns and things listed. And I thought, oh, cool, I'll be able to be a human with, like, antlers and a mane and, like, hooves, but it doesn't let you do that, unfortunately. So, no. No, it's a shame. Yeah, see, I don't, I don't think I ever even saw the manual because, yeah, you know, people would st- lose them or steal them all the time from yeah. rental places. Oh, and so I didn't. I, and playing this just recently, uh, that was one of the things that surprised me is because, uh, you know, you can when you're a mammal, like you can grow horns, but then if you have a mane, you actually bite harder, and, like do more damage. Yeah. So, like, I guess, do you want to start at the beginning? Because this is a game that takes you... The The Japanese name of this game is 4.6 billion year story, and it does take you through 4.6 billion years from being a fish to being a human, possibly some other kind of strange mammal. Uh-huh. Hmm. You can, I think, finish the game as a dinosaur if you try really hard, but it's not a good idea. <laughs> Why is it not a good idea? Oh, because the, the dinosaur stats just like are less than that of the mammals. No, that makes no sense. I know, I know. That's that's some bullshit right there. <laughs> I never I never tried it, but could you finish as a bird? I think you can, yeah, because the mammal the mammal is an optional thing. Right. So if you wanted you could I think stay as a bird the whole game. So you start off as a very small fish in this enormous ocean. This part of the game is set basically before land existed. It's called the world before land. The land before time? Do you see what kind of bully Rich is? Oh my god, bully, you just laugh politely and continue talking, okay? See, we, we just finished recording another thing in which Sin thought I actually had scurvy <gasps> oh my as a god. result of a joke I made. And oh my god, what a bully. You gotta out me like that. It's not going well. <laughs> he told me, he was like, I saw my doctor and he says that doing the pirate voice gave me, what did you call it? Psychosomatic scurvy. Psychosomatic <laughs> scurvy. And he sounded so serious and so like depressed. I was like, oh my god, I got scared. I'm like, podcast cancelled, voices cancelled, is rich okay? And then he started laughing. He's like, oh yeah. Like, seriously? I don't think I, I laugh like that. <laughs> yeah, I don't think scurvy is not a life threatening thing anyway. Wait, Richie told me that that it was. Can we just stick to Evo? <laughs> Let's <laughs> talk about it later on. Okay. 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 <laughs> All right. Evo begins with you as a small fish in. It's called the world before land, but you can see it. the the map screen is a very large ocean, but at the very very top you can see like a very small kind of coastline. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And you begin as a little fish, little fish, and all you can really do is bite things. Oh, so cute. And the first thing that's likely to happen is you will swim up to a jellyfish. Mm-hmm. And the jellyfish will inform you, basically, a tutorialized thing. This is, the jellyfish will explain to you that, hey, this is... Uh, this is a game about, they, they call it survival of the fittest, and the idea is you have to eat other animals, and then when you eat them, they will leave behind a piece of meat. The meat, okay, I'll start again. What you have to- Oh, you can be a bitch, I'm very confused after the rune episode. 
So you will begin by swimming up to a jellyfish, and the jellyfish will explain to you that this game is about survival of the fittest, which is the terminology they use. <laughs> jellyfish is intense! <laughs> yeah. So the basic um, gameplay of Evo, and this carries on throughout the rest of the game, is that you have to kill other animals. When you kill them, they leave behind a piece of meat. And when you eat the meat, it partially recovers your hit points, but it also gives you something called evolution points. At any time during the game, you can press select, and that opens the evolution menu. And you can then spend those points on altering the physical makeup of the animal that you have, you're currently playing as. So you can add, like, you can make yourself bigger or smaller. You can give your, as the fish, you can give yourself different kinds of fin. You can make your body made of different things. You can have, like, uh, like a slick body, like an eel, or you can get very, like, tough scales. You can get different kinds of jaw. You can get different kinds of horn. And that's essentially, like, that carries throughout the rest of the game. You just do that, and the way that the game mixes it up is that every time you move from one age to another, so when we leave the ocean, instead of keeping the animal you were playing as, it resets you to like a new kind of form, and you have to evolve all over again. Hmm. Hmm. There's also plants and like non-threatening animals that just sort of hang around in the in the areas like seaweed or sea cucumbers or little crabs and you can just eat those without having to kill them first and they just restore your hit points but they won't give you any evolution points so you can't even though you can evolve into things that look like they should be herbivores you cannot play this game as a herbivore you always have to be a carnivore everything's gonna die yeah well and yeah, it, it's it's quite brutal. I guess we'll get into that later on when we start like massacring entire like species, making orphans. What does EVO stand for? Good question. I tried finding it and I could not find anything. I don't think it stands for anything. I know what it stands for. What does it stand for? It stands for evil. Because, like Alex said, at some point, you literally orphan a little dinosaur baby and then eat its parents in front of it, right? Uh, that's a Yeti, but yeah. Still pretty horrible. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Like, don't, don't you, isn't there something about killing, like, a dinosaur parent as well, or do you just, like, Try to um, rescue the parents. Oh no! You, you, you. We'll, we'll go. I guess we'll talk about that when we get to the dinosaur chapter. But oh, okay. um, yeah, Corvo is here. He says hi. The other thing that um, why are you ignoring me? I'm trying to get through the podcast. Corvo is here. We have to go through 4.6 billion years worth of content. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk to Corvo anytime. Well, I thought I could make reborn anytime, but look how that turned out. Hello, Corvo. Ow. Okay, good. <laughs> Maybe you could evolve Corvo and he could talk to us. <laughs> oh, good one. Okay, go on, Richie. Yeah. So the other thing that you notice about Evo, in contrast to the extremely bloody gameplay and amount of murder that you commit, is everything is extremely cute looking. Yeah, it is. Yes. Very cute murder. Very cute. Yeah, you you have like the the jellyfish have like big eyes, and when they attack you, they sort of like they wave at you. And there's like um, your fish when you double tap, you swim very fast, and you get this extremely strange expression when you do it. All the animals you can make in this, I think, with the exception of the human, all look extremely cute. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So I guess we should. Talk about how this is a kind of adaptation of an existing game. Pokemon? Maybe. Okay. It's it's the it's an adaptation of a Japanese computer role playing game that is also called Four Point Six Billion Year Story. What? Yeah, that one does not have the same art style. Um, it's a lot. It's attempting a much more realistic look to it. It doesn't have the kind of cartoony animals in it. And that it that essentially plays completely differently. There's a couple of things that 
carry over from that game to Evo, but Evo is essentially like a do-over of basically every system from 4.6 billion year story. So is it done by the same people? Or? I don't think it is. The things that carry over, from my knowledge, it's pretty much just the sum of the music, which we'll get into, and also the the central, um, I guess, pr- the premise of Evo is that your life form is being watched over by Gaia, who is the spirit of the Earth, and she's depicted as a blue-haired anime girl who appears in between the, the ages and sort of informs you of things. And... Um, she is guarding you, sort of. If you die, she will bring you back to life, and she will tell you what to do, and she'll kind of give you updates on like how the world is changing. She is a carryover from the the PC version, but something we talked about on stream that they didn't carry over is that in the PC version, there's also Lucifer, who is a kind of spider moth monster with the head of Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> and she is your nemesis throughout it, and you are sort of tr- your tr- Gaia and Lucifer are in combat with each other, and you're sort of Gaia's champion, I guess, against what Lucifer is doing. So why didn't that carry over? Um, they may not have wanted Lucifer in an SNES game, although no, this was Japanese, so they probably wouldn't have cared. I think they just simplified it massively. It wasn't as cute. Yeah, and like um, another thing that that PC version does is that this game Evo ends with the evolution of humans. The game stops there, whereas in the PC version it can continue forward to like the distant future, and you have all these like hum- far future sort of mutant humans living with aliens on space like colonies and things like that. I saw what was the original one like a PC game. Is that what they said? Yeah, it's a Japanese PC game. So if you want to, you can't like run it normally. You have to have a Japanese PC emulator. Yeah. Another thing that the Japanese PC version does is it sort of does the evolution system backwards to the way it's done here. Because in this one, you you choose the creature you want to evolve into, and your stats reflect that. Whereas in the PC one, you upgrade your stats individually, and then your appearance will change to represent your stats. So if you start like building like lots of defense and strength, then your character you will evolve into a different kind of animal to represent that. So you don't have the same degree of control over what you look like, and I think the controlling what you look like is the big appeal of this because the level design. We'll get to that, but it absolutely like goes off a cliff very, very rapidly. <laughs> so that the idea of control, like having control over this constantly changing creature, is sort of that's the draw card. That's, that's that is definitely the big hook. Yeah. So the world before land. There's a couple of unique things about this that you don't get later on. Um, one of them is that you can evolve a, a horn like an anglerfish. And if you have that, then the enemies will sort of swim toward you, but they won't attack, and they'll just be entranced by your little glowing horn. That lets you that lets you um fight them off without them attacking you back. Like that's that's a very interesting thing. And they don't that's like the only instance in the game where they let you have like a lure. Some sort of like it's a trick you can play on enemies. That's immediately dropped after the ocean. Oh my god, it's a Joker trick. Joker's trick. <laughs> the other thing that the ocean lets you do is that um, you, you have the capacity to evolve different kinds of horn. The anglerfish horn is one. Most of the other horns, and I think I think every horn after this chapter, all it means is that if you charge at something, you'll do extra damage, but the horn will eventually break. But the... The fish chapter has two unique horns. It's got that angler one, and it's also got a swordfish's horn. If you evolve the swordfish's horn, it's not as strong as the other horns, but it will never break, because you're like a swordfish, so it's just your nose. So you can be a swordfish and just charge at everything. Yeah, so the downside of all this is that the amount of evolution points you get from killing things is extremely small. So if you want to evolve and you want to experiment, you just have to spend an absolute eternity grinding on like jellyfish or like amoeba to get your 
Evo points up. I think that's one of those things that, as an adult, seems really tedious. Yeah. But when I was a kid, it was amazing to me that I would just sit there and do that <laughs> yeah. for yeah. hours. <laughs> the other thing that's introduced in this chapter, which is a like a recurring plot strand throughout the game, is that there's strange crystals that you find. They're little little crystal orbs, and if you eat them, they come in different colors. There's a yellow, green, red, and blue. And when you eat them, they will do something, like, strange. Like, yellow ones, if you eat them, you get a strange message. It will say that something in your body is speaking. So it's like the crystal is some sort of telepathic thing. If you eat a red one, you will evolve into a unique thing that you can't normally become. So in the fish chapter, if you eat the red one, I don't know if this is random. I think it might be based on your body size. But when you eat it, you'll become either a stingray or an eel, which is not something you can normally do. And that's a temporary thing, so there, you'll stay a stingray or an eel for like a couple of levels and then ship back again. The blue ones just give you a ton of Evo points, and the green ones let you basically reverse evolution and go back and become an earlier creature temporarily, which is not not a thing you can do in the fish level because you haven't evolved anything yet. But um, the way Evo works is... When you evolve a new creature, you can then save it to the cartridge as, like, you can name it and it'll show up in, like, a little sort of bestiary thing. And then if you have a green crystal at any point, you can go back to that bestiary and become something that you've already saved. And these crystals form, like, a sort of plot throughout the game that like it's everyone you speak to is sort of clear that like these crystals are unnatural and we don't know where they came from and they're having adverse effects on the way things are evolving and this sort of develops throughout the game the mystery of where the crystals mm-hmm. came from and i think you you were talking about the uh being able to save some of the creatures you had evolved into and it was to the cartridge, wasn't it? Like it would yeah, carry yeah, over. To it was, yes, game. yeah. Well, I remember that because of renting the game and then seeing other people's creatures. Yeah, and you could use them to sort of sequence break some parts. Like you could become a bird like earlier than you were supposed to, which would give you like the ability to fly to places you otherwise could. So it, it was almost like a roguelike. In, 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 a, in a way, yeah, yeah. So I, I guess like. What we've described is kind of that is the ocean chapter. It is just eating things and gradually evolving into a different fish. Um, the the plot, such as it is, of the ocean chapter is that there are sea creatures, sea plants that are producing oxygen. And the oxygen is going to the surface world, which is, of course, what actually did happen. Oxygen is a waste product created by undersea plants. And the it's clear to you that, like, in order for time to move... It has a weird view that, like, it's about Darwinian evolution, but also there's an end point that you have to work toward. So it's like... There's, like, a teleology to it that's not actually kind of... It's, it's, we talked about it on the stream, but it's this weird combination of, like, it's Darwinian evolution, but also it's creationism, but also it's intelligent design, but also it was aliens. <laughs> and there's sort of all four of those things are happening at once. So, like, we're trying to follow the principle that you're, like, adapting to your environment, but then there's also, like, Gaia is showing up and saying, no, no, this thing has to happen for evolution to move forward. So it's 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 sort of odd if you stop and think about it. So in order for evolution to move forward from the fish chapter, you have to make sure that the oxygen is being produced. But the problem is that there's a group of sharks that are hanging around these plants and saying, like, they're, 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 I think uh, they're either eating or just controlling the plants and preventing them from producing oxygen. And if you talk to the sharks, they say to you that, yes, like, we don't want life to evolve on land. We want everything to stay in the sea because we're the strongest thing in the sea. So we want to always be in charge. Mm. So that leads you to a confrontation with the king of the sharks. <laughs> the king of the sharks? Yeah, the king of the sharks is is unfortunately not wearing a crown. It's very disappointing. Did Logaria steal his crown? 
it's possible. Uh, I guess, like, before we leave the ocean chapter, it has extremely good music. It's this very sort of sweeping ambience, like, dreamlike music that plays throughout that chapter. Yeah, it kind of goes downhill some parts after that. Yeah, um... (laughs) Okay, so... We then encounter the King Shark. The bosses in Evo are extremely bad. This is one of the more tolerable ones because it is just that standard video game scenario where you're like kind of like baiting this thing to charge at you. Then you move out of the way very quickly. It will hit an obstacle and stun itself and then you can bite it while it's stunned. So it, it, it sort of pays off, I think, to be maybe smaller and more agile when you get there than if you'd made a big defensive, like, a uh, coelacanth thing. Maybe if you were, like, something smaller, you, you'd have a better shot at fighting this thing. Uh, when you kill it, it, um, it explodes into sushi, <laughs> which gives you a ton of Evo points. The problem is that having received a ton of Evo points, it, the chapter is now over, so there's nothing for you to evolve into. And this is a recurring issue with all of th- this game. It has a couple of like mid bosses, but the problem is that because of the structure of it, you'll beat a boss. Suddenly you'll have like 10,000 Evo points, but then the chapter will end and you'll be reset and being reset also sets your Evo points back to zero. So it's not that gr- unless you, I guess, wanted to make something save it so you could bring it back later on. But other than that, um, you don't get, there's not a ton, it doesn't feel like a reward when you get all those Evo points for beating those bosses. Um, yeah, so that then, upon defeat of the King Shark, we can start getting oxygen. You then leap onto the land in your fish. Uh, you get a little message, this is the first time you'll see it, that says the change of circumstance has altered evolution. And when that happens, your feet, your little fins suddenly turn into feet and you can walk around as a little legged fish. And that lasts for about three seconds. Oh. And yeah, you have about three seconds of time to be a little legged fish, which is kind of cute. And then Gaia immediately accelerates time to the amphibian age and you are reset to the base amphibian, which is kind of like a salamander like a little little sort of um squidgy lizard thing (laughs) yeah and then we leave the ocean behind and we are now in the amphibian age we grew up so fast and we did yeah i don't know if it's worth mentioning that there's a like interdimensional door or something that I'm yeah on. yeah <laughs> yeah the, the the way in which time moves forward is that gaia it's like the, the monolith from 2001 will appear in front of you and then that will open a portal and you'll walk through it and then it's, it's a couple of billion years later yeah yeah so the next the amphibian age chapter is the a lot of the map is still underwater in this case. So you do a lot of switching between forms in this. Because every time your, amphi- your amphibian starts off with legs, but every time it jumps in the water, the legs become fins. So you can, then, you can swim. Yes, yeah, circumstances change. So you become like, you, you don't go back to being a fish, but you become aquatic. So in order to make progress, there are several parts in this where you will essentially go back to the fish style levels but as your amphibian and you can meet fish in those levels and the fish will say to you that like evolution has kind of left them behind they're stuck being fish even though the world on land is prospering so the amphibian is it's where the game starts you start to see like cracks form i think in the game you're playing how so? Well, the music takes a real nosedive in terms of quality. Like we were talking about the the fish levels having this very nice sort of sweeping, like dreamy music, and then the amphibian music is basically <laughs> it's it's inc- it, the incredible sort of bathos kicks in when that happens. Richie, that should like, be symbolic. You know how there's like renaissance paintings the 
yeah, Multiple yeah. Paintings, and then there's the Dada is Mera, so it's like yeah. So you think it's Dadaism? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think I think like the thing with a lot of the music is it wouldn't be that bad, but it's only like four bars long, maybe most of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the the other issue that becomes apparent with the amphibian chapter is that from now on, pretty much every level is going to be a straight line with no terrain. And one or two animals every screen. And they essentially just exist to be a place to farm that animal. So you'll see, like, it'll, they will be called names like, like, domain of, like, this kind of amphibian. It will just be, like, six of those in a row with no terrain features, really nothing to do. And you either have to jump over them or you can just farm them, eat them, do the level again, eat them again. And, this is where, like, really what this game has going for it at this point is the central evolution thing. The level design is, like, almost non-existent from this point onward. It's just lines. They're just, it's it's almost, like, abstracted out. It's just, like, this is, if you want to farm this creature, you go to this level and there's nothing else there. Hmm. So the right. amphibian, yeah. They might, they might put something in that flies occasionally or something. <laughs> occasionally, yeah. Yeah, there's there's some places later on where they do a bit better, but like I'd say maybe 80% of the levels from this point on are just a straight line. Okay, but have right. you been to an Apple store? Go on. It's also very, like, minimalistic. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. So maybe this game was just ahead of its time. It was in some ways. In some ways. There we go. Not in this way, though. Oh, shade! <laughs> <laughs> so, the amphibian has about as much flexibility as the fish. You can basically just go anywhere from, like, a small, fast thing up to a large, kind of slow thing. You can get some... Um, you can get different dorsal fins in this point. So, like, dorsal fins, that depending on the fin you get, you can get extra defense, you can get extra hit points. You can get little vestigial wings if you want that let you... You can't fly, but you can jump much higher and sort of glide with them. And your goal in the amphibian chapter to begin with is that the... The oxygen has led to all these plants growing on the surface. No, sorry. The oxygen has led to all the the insects. Okay. The plot of the amphibian chapter is that because all life is moving onto land, there's plants everywhere, but the plants are being eaten by the insects. So it starts off with you. You actually change sides during this. You start aiding the insects because they want you to take out what they call prime frog? No, 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 Debu Stegger. What, what are you talking about? What are you saying? <laughs> is this therapy that's spreading in your brain? There's something that's eating the insects. So you start having to fight off that thing because it's eating the insects. But then the insect population goes up. And then you have to fight off the insect bosses. Is that what happens? I believe. No, I can't. I remember. Yeah, no. The prime, the prime frog is in the dinosaur chapter. Oh, is it? Oh no, this guy is just a big another big salamander. He's like a bigger salamander thing. Yeah, he he's he's called Debu Stega, which is just like fat. Okay, Richard, how am I going to edit this? I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Well, you should have been paying attention when we streamed it. <gasps> okay, when we streamed it, I was tired, sleepy, and I had a lot to drink. Yeah. Okay? I yes. fell asleep at okay. the end of it. Okay. All right. When the amphibian chapter starts, your first... You, there's a lot of the map you can't explore most of it now. You have to go along a certain route. That route takes you back through the ocean, so you become... An aquatic creature again briefly. You can talk to fish. The fish will tell you that they have been left behind by evolution. 
you'll go back onto the land. This is again the the whole like they do the interesting thing with you being an amphibian and that there is a lot of water here. So like an amphibian, you will be going to and from the water, from the water to the land. Pretty. Yes. Do you know what else is an amphibian? What? <laughs> Your face. Yeah. Good. <laughs> So your first goal is, from memory, you are informed by another, another. They they call the salamanders Ikustega, which I think is like a lot. A lot of the creatures in this, their name is like a scientific name that's been translated into Japanese and then back again into English phonetically. So. They kind of sound like like coelacanths. I think are called coela fish. So I, I can't remember what an iku I, iku stega will be. It'll be some. There'll be some amphibian with a name close to iku stega. You're told by this like iku stega elder that there is a a particularly fat, greedy iku stega who is like eating everything. Oh no! So you're go- called debu stega. Debu means fat, so he's fat iku stega. Your goal is to get rid of Debu Stega, because that will, like, because he's basically, like, eating, he's disrupting, like, the environment by eating too much. So your goal is to sort of go across these series of flat levels with nothing in them until you get to, to Debu Stega. Debu Stega is, like, a mid-boss. He is kind of a relief. Um, the bosses haven't gotten impossible yet, so Debu Stega is basically just a big, fat, slow thing. You can very, very easily just stun lock him in a corner because he's not very fast. He will try to jump on you, but if you just get out of the way, he will go splat and then you can just bite him. Oh, wow. Yeah. And upon defeating Debu Stega, you get informed that, okay, now like the plants are back. I think that also leads to the insects coming back. I think, yeah, it's something like once you get rid of Debu Stega, the plants grow back. And because there's more plants, there's also more insects. Well, some, somewhere in there, it's, it turns into the insects are eating all the plants. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think it's you defeat the Ikustega, that, that allows the insects to, to prosper. Like wasps. But because the... Yeah, you and, yeah, because you have now defeated the Ikustega, there's now a population explosion of insects, so the rest of the chapter becomes you fighting back against the insects who are trying to eat everything again. Yeah. Including other salamanders. Yeah. So, the next half of this map involves you waging war on the insects. Oh no! You meet the the Ikustega again, who warned you about Debustega, and he has been he has been killed by a huge he has these huge bee stings stuck in him. Aww. And he he dies, and then when he dies, like all things, he leaves behind meat. Mm-hmm. And his meat is, like, unique, and it grants you a ton of Evo points, and I think it fully restores your health, so you can fight the the first of the insect leaders, which is the king bee. The, um... the There are a lot of, like, passive insects in this area that just sort of fly around, and you can get health back by just eating them. You can also get health back by eating insect eggs. So you eat insects and their babies. Yeah, and then you encounter the king bee, which is where the boss design becomes an insufferable nightmare. Why? King bee can fly. Um, Even if you up your amphibian to be like the maximum jump, it's still going to outmaneuver you. And King Bee attacks by firing stingers in salvos of, I think it's like three or four at a time that hit you in sequence. So if you're not moving as fast as you can away from King Bee when those fire, all three of them will hit you and that will, unless you have absolutely pushed your hit points and defense to maximum, that is going to kill you. Yeah. Like it's not survivable. This is where the issue with the way Evo handles hit points comes in, because while there are little things throughout the level you can eat that give you hit points back, they give you in the vicinity of like two to five hit points back in a game where 
at this point, your hit points will be around like 50. And the boss is doing like either just straight up killing you or taking you down to like one or two with these attacks. So eating those things to stay alive during the boss fight isn't feasible. But what happens is every time you evolve, because you've become a new creature, it resets everything, and that includes your hit points. So what happens is in this fight that drags on for an eternity, because most of the time you can't actually reach the boss because it's up too high, you just have to constantly evolve something. You have to find something on the menu that doesn't cost that many evolution points to do, like growing a horn and then removing it, and just do that over and over and over again every time you take damage. And it is incredibly tedious. Like, it's not, it's not really hard, it just goes forever, and if you mess up, you die. Yeah, I mean, the, the bosses at this point are very... Uh... You just you kind of come in and you win or lose, and that's pretty much it. Yeah, and the problem is that if you lose, you don't have lives, but I think your Evo points get halved. Yeah. Yeah, so every time you want to fight this boss, you have to keep in mind you will need to constantly evolve during the fight. So you want to have a stockpile of like a couple of thousand evolution points handy to heal yourself with. But... In order to get those, you then have to revisit these levels that are just a straight line and just eat everything, like, over and over again for, like, ten minutes until you have enough evolution points to, like, last the fight. And, um, yeah, it's it's really, like... It's not fun. (laughs) It's really, really awful. And then you get to do it again later. Yeah, so... When you finally defeat the King B, because King B is a mid-boss, the evolution points it drops are actually useful. So you can evolve your little amphibian to become something new. And you then travel through, again, another group of straight lines. This time they have, uh, they have bees and wasps on them. And you start to notice that this is because the insects are now multiplying. That's sort of represented by these you will see like the little Ikustega walking around and then the wasps will land, pick them up and fly away. And if you want, you can like bite the wasps out of midair and they'll drop the Ikustega. So you, you get the impression like, okay, the insects are now about to completely decimate the Ikustega population. You have to stop them. So again, that just leads to a bunch of straight lines again. Um, culminating in the exact same fight with the king bee, only now it's the queen bee. And it's the same boss with more hit points. <laughs> I think she, and I think she bites you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the other one didn't have. Yeah, yeah. So, I, like, they do a decent job, I think, like, in terms of the pacing at this point, because the the evolution itself is quite, is gradual. You will still be tinkering with your little creature by the time you get to the end, and that's what's going to keep you going. Because, like, even though this level design is not great, the fights are very repetitive, watching your creature very gradually change from, like, a little amphibian to a sort of, like, you can become, like, an axolotl dragon thing. You can get, like, a a tail that's sort of coiled up that lets you jump really high. You can get, uh, like, little different fins and, like, crests on the back of your head that give you slightly different stats and that's going to keep you going um but yeah the the fight with the queen bee is is incredibly tedious i think it might be slightly easier than the king bee in some ways because the king bee is is fought inside a hive where there's walls everywhere that you can get caught on whereas the queen bee is fought in a desert well it's it's just a big it's uneven terrain when you fight the king yeah so yeah, you have a yeah. You can't just run back and forth. You have to actually jump. Yeah. So. And yeah, that um, the defeat of the queen bee signals the arrival of the the dinosaur age. Woo! Hype. Yeah. So your little amphibian dragon thing is then turned into a small kind of quadruped dinosaur, and time moves forward again. And um, you're now in the dinosaur age. You don't look cool anymore. 
Yeah, you know, you well, you look like Littlefoot from the land before, like right down to the color. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of what happens in this game. Like you start to look cool, and then they take it away from you. Yeah, basically. Yeah, that that's sort of, in a sense, that's the saving grace of it that they keep giving you new things to turn into. Yeah, that it sort of doesn't like the repetition of the actual act of playing it. Yeah, is offset by your all. You always have something like it's like a little like carrot. Like it's not. You know that, like, okay, my my neck can grow, but I only need like another two hundred for that. So it's it's not like a big single, like, okay, I've leveled up. It's like very, very gradual, iterative yeah. process of like tinkering with one thing, and that's that's what keeps you invested, in spite of everything else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So now that you have defeated insects. Reptiles are in charge, and it's the dinosaur age. The dinosaur is the most flexible of all the things you can turn into. Has a really interesting mechanic to it where you start off as a quadruped, and then you also have... You can do a thing where you stand on your hind legs, and that sort of... You you end up stooped over slightly. Like, you're on your back legs, but your torso is still facing forward, like a Tyrannosaurus. Velociraptor. Yeah, like a Velociraptor thing, but you can also push that even further and essentially be standing upright. So you have, like, along with all the other changes you can do, you have three different configurations of how your legs and arms work, which is interesting. And that one's kind of like can, Godzilla looking. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can also have different sight. Your the length of your neck becomes important here, and because that works in tandem with how you're standing. Because if you, say, have a very long neck and you're on your hind legs, you actually can't reach anything on the ground. Like, it just won't let you. And likewise, if you're a very squat thing with a very short neck, you cannot reach things above you. So you have to kind of pick, like, what path you're going to go down at this point, because it will completely alter how you play it. And they both have advantages and disadvantages, because some... Creatures are very low to the ground. It makes it hard to fight them if you have a long neck. But also, there's some, there's like a bunch of items and like evolution points and like crystals and things that are above you that you want to have a long neck to be able to grab. Mm-hmm. You'll get floating, floating meat. Is where we yeah, it. yeah. If you, if you're tall, the meat will just kind of float. Up yeah, you after you kill something. Yeah. So you have a lot of, this is, I think, my favorite part of it, because you just have so many options of the kind of thing you want to create. You can you can make anything from, like, a little sort of, like, four-legged Triceratops thing up to, like, like you were saying, like a Godzilla thing or a Velociraptor thing. Mm-hmm. Mm. So I, my favorite yeah. was, uh, I used to make, like, a midget Godzilla, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which kind um, of like a, like a frayed lizard, I guess. Yeah, yeah. They and again they all have extremely cute like faces oh. and things. They're like Yeah. So the central plot of the um the dinosaur chapter is that there is a place called Mount Brave that the dinosaurs have heard of and they say that hey, if you something will happen if you climb this thing and jump off it. And the closer you get to Mount Brave, the more you start seeing, instead of four-legged sauropod things, you start seeing, like, pterodactyls. And it turns out that in Mount Brave, if you get to the very top, and you have to have evolved to be standing totally upright for this to work, if you leap off, it resets your evolution again, but it does it in the middle of the chapter instead of at the end. And you go from being a dinosaur to being a bird. Circumstances change again. Yeah. But what's what's interesting is that you don't have to. Like, you can do that chapter just as a dinosaur. You can be like a Tyrannosaurus or a, like a Triceratops or whatever for that whole chapter and just ignore the bird thing entirely. It clearly wants you to do the bird thing, but you don't have to. And there's trade-offs for being a bird. Like, it is better to be a bird because, obviously, you're a lot more maneuverable in this game that is all about stun-locking you. But at the same time, the bird has, like, the... I think they, they're they less defensive 
they have like they have feathers instead of scales and um it also interestingly it lets you combine dinosaur and bird parts once you get the bird evolution so you can be a feathered bird but you can also bring in bits and pieces of the old dinosaur stuff so you can be like a a strange like gargoyle monster if you want <laughs> You can make like a dragon if you want. You can have like a Tyrannosaurus's head, but with wings. Me? Yeah. yeah. I think I think the idea uh, it, it, you want you don't have as good a defense, but it's like you have maneuverability, but it's traded yeah. off that you still have to get close to stuff. Yeah. To fight it, you have still have to get like, right up next to it to bite it, and what? Yeah. You also you can't go back. Is the thing once you're a bird, there's no way to go back to being a dinosaur. Right. Yeah. Right. So this also leads to a, there's like an optional part of this that only works if you're a bird, which is that there is a cloud that you see moving around the map screen. And if you, only if you are in bird form, if you touch a level with that cloud above it, instead of going to the level, you will go into the cloud. And the cloud is, we're kind of back again to the, the, almost like the level design they used in the fish areas where it's like a big open maze space of all these tunnels, but it, the tunnels are in the cloud. And you have to navigate this cloud maze, and there's a bunch of like hidden stuff here. There's those blue crystals that give you a ton of evolution points. There's also a red crystal that if you eat it, you will become just a straight-up dragon. With like, like, you look like a dragon, you don't look like a flying dinosaur. And if you successfully navigate this maze and pop out the top, you actually end up in space. And things start to get very odd because you can see in space there are all these little aliens and they look like the standard like gray alien. They have like the the big heads with the almond eyes and they have they're wearing like 1950s sort of bubble helmet spacesuits. And they're all flying around in space. And they're doing something to the animals there. There's like the flying dinosaurs you've seen before, but now the aliens are sort of, they're almost experimenting on them in some way. They're shooting like weird rays at them. And I think, I think it's possible I wasn't able to do it. You can encounter a UFO here that's like flying around in space. I think if you look in the right spot, but I wasn't able to find it this time. And it turns out that this is the, what you're flying around now is the asteroid that is going to hit the Earth and wipe out the dinosaurs. And if you talk to the birds up there, the flying dinosaurs, they will say, yeah, we know that the asteroid's going to hit and kill everyone, so we're going to live here in our, like, we're going to live above the, above the cloud of debris, basically, in space. And it, this is sort of going back into the whole crystal thing that like at this point it becomes apparent that the reason these weird evolution crystals that are messing with the course of evolution are, are flying around and like lying around on, on the surface is because the aliens did it it's like these aliens are landing and they're like leaving behind these evolution crystals and that's kind of what's causing the problems with the world that things are evolving wrong that's where it gets a little strange of there's this mythology. Cause I don't think we said it, but like at the beginning they talk about the sun is almost like a God kind of figure. Yeah. And he has nine children, which are the planets. And then he decides to put life on Gaia earth. Yeah. And then that's like whichever species or whichever animal survives is the one that becomes, will will populate the planet with Gaia. Yeah. The idea. Yeah. And then, then they throw in aliens are also monkeying around <laughs> with uh, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> there. So there's a lot of th stuff going on at yeah. the same time. The other plot strand of this chapter is that there is a Styracosaurus that has lost its child. You kind of have to go and just beat a boss that is guarding the child. This boss is not that memorable. It's just a frog. Just a very big frog that mm -hmm. it jumps at you. You move out of the way. You bite it when it lands. It's there's no real drama. Defeat the frog. You re you reunite them. Um, then the chapter does not have like a big boss at the end of it. Instead, there's just a, an area that is full of tyrannosauruses. And I don't know if it's timed or it's based on the number that you kill. But eventually, after you fought with the tyrannosauruses for long enough, 
the asteroid belt starts dropping asteroids on the planet. Um, so Gaia then rescues you as they're falling, and you it makes a point of showing you that the Styracosaurus and its child died. Like very graphically on screen. <laughs> they are killed when the when the meteorites strike. And you takes get, out everybody. Yeah, takes you get to see all the all the dinosaurs you were fighting and now just like lying on the ground. There's all these like rocks and molten things falling from the sky. And yeah, they're dead. I believe you see a couple of a uh, couple of them like squished by a rock even yeah and they make a point of showing you that there's a bunch of dead babies as well oh jesus miyazaki come on (laughs) so that yeah um that is the end of the dinosaurs sort of Hmm. with the whole bird bird flying bird fortress is unresolved for now Uh, foreshadowing foreshadowing yeah they they will come back so you're now in the the Ice Age, which is caused because of the uh, meteorites hitting the Earth, the dust is kicked up into the atmosphere, the planet freezes. So the, you get the Ice Age map, which is kind of interestingly designed because it's not, it's not entirely frozen, it's just the northern hemisphere that's frozen. So the what we have now actually looks like a map of the world as we know it. It's not Pangea, the continents have split and broken apart and the ocean has receded, so we're now at the we start off in the northern hemisphere at the very very top and it's completely frozen over but gaia did not change us when we moved from being a dinosaur to when we when we changed ages gaia didn't change us we're still what we were at the end of the dinosaur chapter so we could still be a bird we could still be a little little tyrannosaurus thing if we wanted and um you actually encounter here the ghosts of all the dinosaurs who died for real? Yeah, they're reunited in the afterlife. Oh, well, I guess then that's a good end. It's kind of a happy ending, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Except they've been ghosts for, like, millions of years. Yeah, it's, yeah. So are they, like, trapped here? They seem happy. Okay. Yeah. So you're then given the choice to become a mammal, but you don't actually have to. Mm-hmm. The advantage once you're a mammal, it like you become a sort of tiny cat mouse thing. So your cool dinosaur is not there anymore. Okay. Um you may want to stay a bird is the thing, because like birds have once you're a mammal, you can't fly anymore. So you maybe want to consider if it's worth staying as a bird. Mm-hmm. Because that will make some parts of it much, much easier because everything is frozen now and the game is using ice physics. If you are a dinosaur and you try to move on the ice, you basically can't do it. You just slip and slide everywhere. But if you evolve into a mammal, you gain the ability to get traction on the ice. So again, you have to like it clearly wants you to become a mammal. If you if you stay as a dinosaur, you're really handicapping yourself, but it's an option. Mm-hmm. So when you become a mammal, you are a sort of small cat thing. You look like a, like a little mouse, sort of. You, you can change the kind of body type you have instead of having, like, two legs, four legs. You get, like, um, they talk about shapes, so you can get, like, a cat-shaped body, a rabbit-shaped body, um, a horse-shaped body, a rhino-shaped body, things like that. And this introduces a new mechanic, which is kicking. So if you are, because you are a four-legged thing, you can, with long legs, you can now kick behind you like a horse. Hmm. So if you evolve a horse-shaped body, you end up with very, very strong legs, which means that your primary method of attack, instead of biting things, you can kick them. So kicking hits whatever is behind you, and it's very, very fast, so... It's also extremely strong if you have the right kind of body for it. So some of the bosses that you encounter in this area, you can just stun lock them by repeatedly kicking them because they'll just bounce off you, run back, you kick them again, they run back again. And you just get them in a loop and they won't be able to touch you. But alternatively, like you could make, you go for a cat-shaped body and make yourself a lion and you could bite everything. You can... 
um, like Alex mentioned, becoming uh, like a rhinoceros. That's that's possible as well. Yeah. It can be like a big kind of armor plated thing with like low to the ground, but with a lot of strength. So you I have a rhino body kick as well. Because I can. I think that. they can all kick, but the horse is the best at kicking. Okay. Right. So yeah, you have a lot of options, but I think not quite as many as with the uh, as with the dinosaur. So the the Ice Age chapter involves you going from the Northern Hemisphere down to the Southern Hemisphere, and then, because this is the only time the game does it, because it's a map of the world, if you go down through the bottom of the Southern Hemisphere, you wrap around and end up in the Northern one again. So you can, you go all the way down to the South, and then you sort of just like circumnavigate the globe and end up back in the frozen area again. And when you do that, you are forced to fight a group of mammoths. Um, this fight is... It's basically fine, because it's just fighting three things in a row that are all exactly the same. Um, the mammoths charge at you. If you are a horse, you can just kick them as soon as they get close to you. They will just charge again. You can kick them again. There's nothing to it. And they, they shoot bubbles. Yeah, they can shoot bubbles out of their trunks. and. Um, the other that will get you they'll make some progress, but then in order to make most of the progress, you have to there is a, a a mountain in the center of the map that has all these clouds around it. And if you approach the mountain, a strange bird man. It's like a it looks like a human, like a winged humanoid with like a beak, will come down and capture you and take you to this this castle. So you you travel to the it's called Fort Birdman and you discover that the the birds who were building the city in the asteroid belt that survived the extinction um they were working in tandem with the aliens and they now have massively increased intelligence and they've built a a fortress on this mountain that only they can get to because only they can fly. Hmm. Hmm. So they're the antagonist for this chapter. It's getting rid of the bird people. Because again, the game is clear that like, okay, this because aliens interfered with evolution, this like doesn't count. This isn't how it was supposed to go. This is like this is like the bad timeline that you have to erase where everyone's ruled by bird people. So the bird fortress is an absolutely horrible teleporter maze. It's awful. Well, it's it's a big maze and it's full of these these um, teleporters, and when you jump in them, they take you to another teleporter. Mm -hmm. That's the whole level, and you don't know where they're going to go. So it's just this this unbelievably tedious trial and error, trying to figure out what order to jump in the teleporters in to get to the end. Um, and I also I also figured out something, yeah. which is that uh, if you evolve further into a human, not to give too much away, yeah, uh, you can't finish this level. Can't because there's some jumps you have. To do. Oh no! God. Because there's some jump. There's some jumps you have to do. Oh no! That you can't do as a human, and you can't go backwards in oh, evolution. No. Oh human. god! <laughs> so I, I figured that out the hard way the other night. <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> um, this game is awesome. <laughs> so I, I just imagine some poor kid, you know, farming, yeah, all day and night, and becoming a human to be cool, yeah. And then getting to this level and not being able to finish the game. Yeah, so the the boss of the horrible maze is the king of the bird people who is wearing like the it's sort of like a mage, they're wearing this like very ornate robe. And um extremely easy because you can just stun lock them. They will just you hit them once, they fly toward the wall, they hit the wall, and then you just continuously bite them. And there's nothing they can do to stop you, or kick them. Yeah, and that's 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 that boss. It's just nothing. <laughs> the bosses in this game are either impossible or nothing. <laughs> wow, you're nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Damn, Richie. It's incredibly anticlimactic that they build up to the like the king of the bird people, and then you just you just mash Y and they die. This is a bird wizard, oh. and you think it'd be really cool, and it's not really. 
I think if you leave it for long enough, it will like create some like clones of itself and do ranged attacks, but that won't happen because you should just. Yeah, I think it creates like energy balls. It, yeah, like, throws at you or something, yeah. but yeah, yeah. It, you don't let it get that far. Yeah, so you just you just hit it over and over again, and eventually it will die. And you probably won't even get hit if you just hit it at the start of the fight. You've won. <laughs> so. The defeat of the bird people somehow causes some ice to melt. I don't remember what the exact cause and effect here is. I I think what it is is the uh, it causes the castle to fall. Oh yeah, yeah. And that breaks something that lets you yeah smashes down a wall or something like that. Yeah. So um, prior to this point, there's been an area that you can't go to because there's a wall of ice. But the destruction of the castle removes the wall, and you end up fighting the yeti. Hmm. So you start off fighting. Uh, the Yeti is. I don't know. The, the Yeti is like not honestly that difficult either. It just sort of jumps around. Um, it does some like almost fighting game moves on you. It tries to like kick you and drop you and things. Yeah. Um, but the, the Yeti is not really the boss because once you defeat the Yeti, you get a little bit of off screen text saying, Husband, where are you? <laughs> and then from off camera arrives another larger female yeti who is pink and she is kind of the the true boss she is much much harder than her husband was she has lipstick on too. she has lipstick on <laughs> she's she's much bigger and she's much stronger so you gotta take out her were they like getting ready to go out and you just killed her husband i think so i think so she did her makeup and everything. Yeah. yeah. And then um, after you defeat them, their child shows up. Aww. And starts crying because you just murdered their parents in front of them. And then you just like callously like walk by him. You like, just leave. Bad. And then Gaia says, well, you know, that's how it is. Yeah. That, that's, that's like the Batman origin story. Is that child Batman? Yeah, that that Yeti is now Batman. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and that now that is over with, uh, you end up in the. Is it called not early man? It's like the dawn of something. We're, we're basically in the final chapter at this yeah, point. I don't remember. Yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna go for like five minutes. I'll be back. Okay. Okay. I bet Rich is gonna go get snacks. He's not even gonna share. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> By the way, if you ever feel like speaking, you can like don't be shy, like interrupt okay. and stuff. Richie speaks uh, a lot, so you gotta have to. Oh yeah, you have to look Richie like that. That's a polite way of getting. <laughs> yeah, I'm coming. No. <laughs> Did you see that? I can hear you. No, I was so through my headphones, even though I'm not wearing them. Oh my god, what a bully! I was showing Alex how to get your attention if he wants to talk. Oh my god, this is what I have to deal with on the daily, Alex. Yeah. Every day? Okay, I can, I can hear you now. Every fucking day! I can just hear in the background, like... Oh my god! I was telling Alex that if you need to interrupt us, don't be shy, basically. Okay. Like, listen to me, Richie! You know? Yeah. 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 Well, I just yeah. heard that part. I got snack. Sandwich. Yeah. Kind of sandwich. Um, bread and dead dinosaurs, I guess. <laughs> we we need to do the sin bear grills thing. What? We are like bear grills, but you're saying like it has been two hours since my last meal. <laughs> If I don't find some McMuffins soon, I'll start. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Alex is quiet. He's worried. Alex, we're oh, joking. Oh, no, you're fine. I was just looking at something on my phone. It's like... It has not been two hours since my last meal. Don't worry. So where were we? Uh, the Ice Age just ended. Yeah, I don't know.
Mm. We took part in the origin of, of Bat Yeti. <laughs> if I put a picture of a Yeti while we're talking about Yetis, will the Yeti copyright strike us? It's possible. Okay. So the Yeti's got good lawyers. <laughs> I did actually know it's funny because uh, I can't even remember how I found it. It was just on Twitter. It was like somebody else's, somebody else liked to tweet. And there was some woman and she had like a detective fiction thing, but the detective was a vampire. Yeah. And like her main love interest was the guy who was like the coroner at the police department. Oh. And, he was a, and he was like a Sasquatch. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Oh. So it, it, it exists. And she was kind of professional too. because She actually had like art for it. It looked like the cover of a real book, like almost like a romance novel or something. Was her name Larissa? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> it reminded me of the whole werewolf lawyer thing. Yeah. So, so you could have yeah. like the law and order show or something with like, Vampire cop arrests somebody, and then werewolf lawyer processes them. <laughs> okay, I found the the profile, and there it's on Twitter, and it's I write monsters. Is the name of their their account, mm-hmm. and their just and their description is I wrote a book where a vampire and a bigfoot fall in love and fight crime. Aww. yet yet I'm still allowed to teach children in Florida. <laughs> Where were we? The Ice Age had just ended. The Ice Age had just ended. Yep. And? Well, it's warm. warm. It's warm! So at the end of the previous chapter, we didn't get changed again. We're still whatever mammal we were at the end of, um, at the end of the Ice Age. Okay. Right. How do we leave that long? Gaia takes us to a portal. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you could I, I think it's pretty clear Gaia is kind of stacking the deck in our favor. <laughs> <laughs> like everybody's kind of competing to populate the earth with Gaia, and I think she's kind of already made her choice. Yeah. In us. Right Rhino Lion. <laughs> well, and, and actually, to that point, uh, you can say because when you die, guy is like, "Don't, don't tell my dad, but I'm going to bring you back." That's so cute. <laughs> so the ice is now gone. So instead of having a half frozen map, it's all kind of tropical looking. I guess it's like a lot of yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, no, we have well, it's like fir trees and like this. There's like, um, basically, yeah, okay, we'll start again. It's, I'm tired. I'm tired, Sin, I'm tired. <laughs> what? I didn't say anything. <laughs> I know. I'm apologizing. <laughs> you see, you see, this is Richie, like, I'm being supportive, and he's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then everybody thinks I'm a bully because he's there lying on the floor being like, Sin is mean to me. I have scurvy. <laughs> You just need some vitamin C. <laughs> some vitamin C. That's like that's what is good for scurvy. How did you know that? That's so smart. I don't know. No, that that's why people on ships got it because there was no fruit. Yeah. So if they get on land, it's like just piece of oranges. <laughs> you you know when when I told Sin that scurvy was a result of you not eating enough fruit. Yeah. Um, it was about 45 minutes ago, and she just forgot. Oh. Ooh, Jesus, give me strength, Jesus. We well, you know what the secret ingredient is in, in Dr. Pepper. Scurvy? No, it's prunes. And so you can get, I don't know, prunes have vitamin C. Actually, never mind. It's... Okay, so. <laughs> Sorry. No, this this is on brand. This is what we do. So the ice age has ended. Mm-hmm. The map is no longer half frozen. 
we are still the same animal we were at the end of the previous chapter, but the map has changed and the things on the map have changed. So we're now seeing animals like uh, moose and deer and uh, there's like otters at one point. I think there might be a beaver as well. The otter part is real brief. Yeah, yeah. And actually, there's there's like one seal yeah. in the entire game. Yeah, so we get some new <laughs> some new animals, and um, the also like the climate has shifted, so the background is now like it's not tropical. We're getting like fir trees and forests. It looks like North American kind of like uh, flora there. And there's also bears, and all these like new creatures have come into being after the ice age, but we're still the same. And we stay the same, but there is a there is a forest that has some dinosaurs in it that are like stragglers who managed to survive the Ice Age. And you're given the choice to attack them or leave them be. And if you leave them be, they give you some information, which is that there's a strange new creature that's appearing that has the body of a rabbit and the face of a cat. So that is a clue for something that will come into play later on. You can do it at any point. But if you choose to evolve a rabbit-shaped body and a cat-shaped head, it unlocks a new kind of evolutionary path for you that's not tied to anything Gaia does. It's up to you to sort of unlock it. Um, I guess, like, we'll come back to that later on, but the main attraction of this this chapter, which is the final one, is that you get a a very, very large underwater section that is called the Final Ocean. And if you travel to the Final Ocean, you obviously, it being an ocean, you evolve into a sea-based version of whatever you were before. So you're, basically, your feet will become flippers, and you can be like a seal or um, some sort of strange... You can be like, like a, a rhino. Yeah, you can be you, rhino you can be a rhino reverse. line with flippers if you want at this point. Um, as you go deeper into the ocean, you discover that similar to what happened with the bird people, there are now fish people, and they are riding on other fish, and they have laser guns. Right, of course. Something odd is going on in the final ocean. Something is going on. They might still be there. Yeah. These fish people are called the Rogons. And the story is that they are supp- they are oppressing the other sea-based mammals. In this case, it's the whales. So the whales are being suppressed by these like weird kind of like um fish fish alien people who have like lasers. It's a bit Aquaman. This unlocks a you there's a this is one level where there is a unique evolution just for this level. So what will happen is, after you go into the water, the there's a part of the evolution menu that's called hands and feet, and that's usually grayed out when you're in mammal form, but it comes back on again when you're in the final ocean. And when you use it, the only option is something called evolve further. And if you use that, you will instantly turn from whatever creature you are now into a sort of like dugong thing, like a sea cow. But, and that will then gray out everything else except hands and feet again. And all you can do from this point on is evolve further in terms of hands and feet. So, as you use more and more evolution points to evolve your hands and feet further you go from a sort of dugong thing into a like weird humanoid monkey thing with webbed feet this is a reference to something people might not know it because it's not talked about anymore but there was a, a brief fad for a thing called the aquatic ape hypothesis which was a theory that the early ancestors of humans at some point went back into the ocean and lived in a semi-aquatic way before going back onto land again. And it was kind of in vogue for a while, and I think that's what the game is drawing on here for this weird, like, creature from the Black Lagoon monkey you can turn into. But if you push it even further, you eventually just turn into a mermaid. Um, Like, straight up, like, top half is a woman, bottom half is a fish. And you can 
play from that point onward as a mermaid. And the mermaid is incredibly overpowered, which is good because once you're the mermaid, you can't evolve any further. Mm -hmm. So there's no way to heal yourself. But she's very, very fast. She's got very high defense, and her attack is a kiss. She does a little kissy face. And whatever is in front of that just gets obliterated. She does like more damage than anything else in the game. Um, it is it is incredibly strong, and it is just for that area. <laughs> so it prevents you from using her anywhere else. Like you can't say, like you can't record the mermaid and then call the mermaid into being in another level. Yeah. It's only ever in Final Ocean you can do the mermaid. So as the mermaid, you fight through the fish people, and then you encounter the king, who is the king of the Rogons. He is uh, basically just the creature from the Black Lagoon, but really big. <laughs> Uh, not a terribly hard fight. The gimmick is that he can shoot these little light balls at you, and if they hit you, they prevent you from seeing anything around you for a while. But he's not difficult at all. You just smooch him to death. Oh. And the, you're then taken to the King of the Whales. Does he have a crown? He doesn't have a crown. Oh. He does have carpet, which is odd, because he's underwater. <laughs> he has a carpet? He has an underwater palace with a carpet and all these like dolphin sort of attendants in the background, <laughs> and he thanks you for he thanks you for defeating the Rogons. Um, is the carpet on the wall? Because if so, then he's definitely a slug. No, no, it's on the ground. It's a red carpet that leads you to the whale king. Okay, okay. is that a thing? Carpet on the wall? Yeah. If you uh, have you never looked at like online uh, Russian dating pictures? <laughs> no, I, I haven't. Okay. In fact, done it. Okay, so <laughs> let me give you an example. Okay, so I'll send Richie the same picture. So, exhibit A. Yep. What a handsome fellow. I know, right? <laughs> I'm trying to find more. Exhibit B. Is it is it normal to wear masks in your dating picture, too? Um, I guess it's a, it's a pretty embarrassing carpet there. So I've got to wear a mask to get a picture next to it. <laughs> oh no, Agent Funk, I sent you a picture before. And then Clydebot said, Whoa there, Agent Funk has requested that Discord block any messages. Are mostly a robot hamster deemed to be explicit. Oh my god, the picture I sent you before didn't get to you? Because the guy was too explicit? <laughs> what is... Is this some setting? To... He's extremely buff. Maybe I can just send you a link to his picture. <laughs> Wait, copy link. Am I going to get copyright striked? Okay, do you see this? Can you click that? Yes. Oh, man. <laughs> also carpet behind him. So, yeah, basically, uh, yeah, I think it had something to do with sound isolation. Or tradition? I don't know. But, like, Slavs love to put their carpet on walls. Yeah, Xenolalia was telling me that she can hook me up with some. Right. She's from Georgia, so she's like, yeah, I can hook you up with, like, Georgian wall carpets if you want. (laughs) (laughs) My mom used to have something like that up on her wall, but it wasn't. Like a decorative slim thing, probably. Yeah. Yeah, cloth on a frame. Yeah, and I've got that window that's held together with a pair of pants. <laughs> People still bring that up to me, by the way, because you included it in an episode. More than one episode, I included it in you several. People are like, are "You okay? Can you afford a new window?" What I'm really worried about is your computer. It's it's working. Oh yeah. Oh, did you see that confidence agent just punk? Oh, it's working. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm still kind of distracted looking at this dude. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot to take in on this. <laughs> He's got a big head too. <laughs> yeah. It's uh. I don't know if he's doing a face or if that's just how he is. It's hard to tell. I don't know. I'm I'm pretty sure he's on steroids too, <laughs> because of the chest acne. <laughs> the chest acne. 
Because that's a thing. Like you get on steroids. Yeah. Like, yeah. I didn't know. He's pretty beefy. I mean, so he's making a face that Sin makes sometimes as well. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but- you, go, you do that and you go ah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this is like moments after he got shot with the dying will bullet, but like before his pants get <laughs> off, you know. <laughs> Maybe I should use this still for our future reborn podcasts. We don't get copyright strikes. What if that guy finds them? <laughs> this is Tsuna in his middle age. <laughs> okay. Okay, so where were we? I don't know. Oh, yeah, the Whale King. Right, yeah. Whale he King. thanks you for defeating the Rogons. Mm-hmm. I can't remember if they... They say this out loud, but I think the idea is the Rogons also screwed around with the alien crystals. And that's why they're like mutant fish people instead of anything we've seen before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the Whale King thanks you by, uh, is it blowing away some like mist or something that's obscuring your path? Something like that. I don't remember. Yeah. Anyway, basically, this allows you onto, like, the final stretch. There's, like, three levels to go at this point. So, if we... Remembering back to the Stegosauruses... Actually, the game calls them Stegosauruses, because there's not enough characters. The Stegosauruses <laughs> tell us about these weird things that have evolved. Uh-huh. So, if you evolve a rabbit's body and a cat's head, that unlocks a new option called Ramothicus body, which is, like, Ramothopithecus. If you evolve into that, you become a monkey. Mm-hmm. The problem is that, like the, um, like the mermaid and the pants and feet, all you can do from now on is evolve further. You don't have any other options. So the whole like appeal of being able to design your own weird creature is now like it's no longer a thing. You're just stuck as a monkey. Mm-hmm. And what it does is the monkey. I think there's like four or five stages you can go through where basically the monkey just gets slightly taller. Eventually they pick up uh, like a bone club, which then becomes a stone club, and then they become a person. Very, uh, I'm not sure from 2001 Space Odyssey. Yeah, very much, yeah. With the bone and everything. Yeah. So at this point you basically have no more control over the thing you are, you're just a dude with an axe. Mm. Yeah, which is kind of disappointing because I was hoping you could do a little more with it. Can't you can't be like a guy with like horns or anything like that. Got to be a got to be a guy in a leopard skin like robe. No minotaur. Yeah, no minotaur. Mm. Oh, no werewolf. Yeah. Very disappointing. No. Yeah. So from this point on, you are just fighting through cave after cave of other, like, like Australopithecus things, not quite humans, uh, not quite Neanderthals. That leads you eventually to, like, actual Neanderthals. There is an incredibly awful boss fight again against a very, very large caveman with a club who is not technically that strong, but he uses his club like a baseball bat. And if he hits you, you go flying off the side of the screen, which causes you to exit the level, and then you just have to go back in again. So it's not an instant death, but in some ways it's kind of worse because he just resets everything. Yeah. Um, Also, at this point, the only option you have is to make yourself bigger or smaller, and that is your only source of healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the further you fight through the Neanderthals, you get to the uh, the dinosaur people, who are like again similar to the Rogons and the bird people. It's like a dead evolutionary branch where you find they're like human dinosaur hybrid things. Uh, you also encounter the aliens again. They have ray guns. You got to deal with those. So you, you're fighting through. Again, it's just, again, we're back into, like, horrible maze territory. There's just a series of lifts that take you to different corridors. Corridors will have different dinosaur people or alien people or Neanderthals in them. You've got to go through them. And then it it culminates in you encountering 
a thing called Bullbox. Yeah. So Bullbox is described as a life form that evolved by consuming all of those crystals that we've been finding throughout the game. So it's, I guess, like what happens at the end of Akira, where Tetsuo like turns into a giant amoeba. It's basically that. And with yeah, an Bullbox is basically a giant amoeba with a sort of like arm thing, but also which also might be the head. Because it, it's yeah, it's his only yeah, weak yeah. Um, so Bullbox is a huge blob with a head, arm, sort of like proboscis thing sticking out the front. Simil- very, very similar to the final boss of Contra 3. Um, Bullbox has a number of rotating kind of crystals inside of it. It will spit them out, and then every one it spits out is a kind of a separate mini-boss. So, like, it will spit out one that might turn into a giant cockroach that you have to fight off, uh, might turn into, like, a bird. Some of them are like, kind of a gimme. Like, there's one that it turns into one of the Ikustego from the Amphibian chapter, and it will just run off the side of the screen. Sometimes, uh, one of them, I think, is actually a power-up that just, like, gives you a heal mid-fight, which is useful. But yeah, you just have to, like, fight off these mini-bosses that the crystals create, and then you have a very brief window in which you can hit Bulbox in between the, the rounds. And you just have to do that till he's out of crystals. And, um... Yeah, I mean, Sin Sin was there when I fought Bullbox. Mm-hmm. And it's really, really not a pleasant experience. Because it's just, <laughs> it does a thing, two, two of the things it's, no, three of the things it summons can fly. And fights against things that can fly in this game are hideous, because unless you are a bird, you cannot fly. You have to jump. But the jumping is not very easy to control. So you're basically stuck in a position where you just have to wait for this thing to be head height and then bite it and hope it doesn't hit you back. Yeah. Was one of them a fish? There, Yeah, there is a fish and it floats in the middle of the screen. Yeah. Yeah. It does. I mean, I was thinking because you don't go underwater or anything. It just is yeah. a yeah. floating fish. Yeah. And again, if, if you're the human by this point, which it sort of wants you to be because this is the final boss. Um, there's really nothing you can do because you can't evolve into anything else. You just have to wait for it to be roughly axe height and just hit it. Yeah. You'd be short or tall. That's pretty much it. Yeah, and you, you have no other forms of attack as a human. You have to use the axe. Yeah, can't kick. Yeah. Yeah, you can't. I think I mean, you might be able to charge. I can't remember. but um, I don't know. Yeah, the, it's a very... It, it, you Basically, you have an incredibly limited move set at this point, and you're just at the mercy of this gigantic, like, here's a cockroach with 5,000 hit points. You take off maybe 200 when you hit it. You just have to sit there and just wait for it to die. It's horrible. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and then you get to eat cockroach meat so you can keep getting big and small. Yeah, yeah. And all you you just sit there hitting this thing every time you're about to run out of hit points, you change size to heal yourself. Yeah, so um, good concept for a boss, mm-hmm. but it arrives at the point in the game where you are just stuck as one thing and you can't do anything with it. Right. Yeah. You would think it, it kind of just makes being a human look like it sucks. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. So it reflects reality. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, you would think like being human you should, you know, you, you create, like, a flaming spear or something, or a bow yeah. and arrow. Oh, come on, Alex. When was the last time you created a bow and arrow? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I could at least set a stick on fire or something. <laughs> even even just tying a rock to a long stick to make, like, a spear be something. <laughs> yeah. But, so yeah, um, defeating Bullbox, you get to go see Gaia, and that is the end of the game. Yay! We just got a little spiel from from Gaia about how like you've proven you're the top life form, mm. and um, yeah, you populate the Earth. And I guess like that's it's meant to be that you're a human, and that's why humans populate the Earth now. But how do you populate the Earth by yourself? Well, I don't really know because I don't know what we're even meant to be. 
because well i think i think the idea is it's you and gaia like yeah like you're adam and eve or something like that but also during this chapter we changed sex that's true because we went from being a mermaid to a male caveman so i don't (laughs) i don't know what we're even meant to be i don't know because uh, I thought that was the idea is like your yeah the sun is like whichever life form is the best will get yeah. with Gaia and populate the earth yeah which again is which again is kind of weird when you're like a a rhinoceros at the end of the game yeah I don't remember it very well but it's it's <laughs> like I saw I saw it. it was a like they show is it after the credits or just before them or it shows like a couple of aliens. And are they supposed to be on Mars? I think they're looking at Earth. Yeah, yeah, Moon or Mars, and how they're going to stop meddling or something like that. Yeah, that they, they've done enough, and they're uh, going to let things play out from here on out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, aliens are real. <laughs> That's what the game is telling us. Yeah. And there were birdmen. <laughs> So yeah, that was that was Evo. Um, I think we said this like after the stream, but it's like very, very good central concept let down by like level design that is not even level design, really. It's like it's like if you opened Mario Maker, like the default thing is that it's just a line and there's nothing on it. Yeah, yeah, and it, I feel like that's a waste of potential because they one thing they kind of get at, but then they don't really do anything with is like different animals can explore these places in different ways. So, like if you are a bird, there are places you can get if you're, you know, that you can't get to if you're on the ground, and like when you're in the ice, there's places that you will slip over if you are a dinosaur, but won't if you're a mammal. I guess because you've got like claws, you can grab onto stuff, but. and. Yeah, like, that's... I feel like it, it maybe needed more of that. It maybe needed, like, like levels that could branch depending on what you were. Because it sort of... It toys with it, but it doesn't go anywhere. And even just things like there's some things you can reach if your neck is long, but then if it's too long, you can't reach things on the ground. Like, that stuff, it's there, but it's not exploited in a way that is that interesting. Hmm. I also, uh, I was looking some stuff up for this game, and I found out that the uh, the music was done by uh, I can't remember his name, but it was the apparently the guy did the music for a lot of stuff, and I guess he did all the Dragon Quest games, or I should say, the early oh ones. yeah, 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 he's really famous, yeah, yeah, he did that, and then yeah. when I read that, I was like, I don't know, like it wasn't that impressive. <laughs> This isn't the game you would show, I guess, is what I mean. I th- I think it, it might also be the sound font that they use rather than the composition, because a lot of it is like... Bah, 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 bah. Yeah, his best work. Yeah, maybe would have sounded better with like yeah. a different... Um, so it's cat. Maybe would have <laughs> sounded better with with it's different a um, a different sound font or a different driver or something. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But I was I was reading about him and they said he was the uh like the first person to have like a like make a, like a symphony just to play video Yeah, games. yeah, the, the Dragon Quest symphonies, yeah. 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 But and the other thing too I found out was like the guys that made this also did uh Act Razor. Yeah, there. yeah. It's uh Enix, isn't it? Which yeah, which is yeah, yeah. a similar deal in that it's a game with a lot of really interesting concepts but doesn't play that well yeah 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 so, I, yeah and they also did um actually i'm thinking of quint well there's quintet and enix sort of work together but yeah. like the like soul blazer is also in there mm-hmm. it's a similar thing of like playing These like are- soul blazer is a game where you play through like a terra enigma as well where you you play through like a very long period of time and you sort of you're one static character, but the whole world goes from like the beginning of time through to the future as you're playing it. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, I was thinking it's with like act raisers. Like these guys are good. Yeah. They're good at with concepts, but not necessarily executing. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sin, do you have anything to add? Yeah, like, I was looking at stuff. Apparently this game was met with some criticism when it came to the graphics. Right. Yeah, They I- like the best part. <laughs> well, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like, on Wikipedia, it said, like, Game Pro magazine said that uh, it had average graphics, and all game whatever that is, said that it had mediocre graphics. It's like, bro, it's 1993. What do you expect? Like, what year are they from? Ooh, this Horizon Zero Dawn DLC looks so poor. Like, shut up. (laughs) Well, that was Evo Search for Eden. Thank you to to Agent (laughs) Funk slash Alex for joining us. Alex, do you want to say anything before we go? Uh, no, I think I'm good. Thanks for joining us, Alex. Thank you very much. And can you remind people of what your Twitter is? It is UltraAlex78. Excellent. Yes. Which is one of those accounts that's really old that yeah. I'd probably take a different name now if I could. But... Uh, is it attached to a Hotmail? I can t- no. I I met someone through through that hotmail account that I'm still friends with today, <laughs> because my hotmail account was one character different from a boyfriend's, and they were having a fight, and she started sending me angry messages, and then I was saying, "Who is this?" And she's like, "Don't fucking no! Don't play dumb with me! I'm sick of your bullshit!" And then by the end of it, she's like, "Oh, this is oh wait, yeah, I forgot the underscore. <laughs> Sorry." <laughs> that was in like 1998 and we're still friends Oh, nice. that's so cute but the joke I was making was about a hot male yeah 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 I know oh okay Richie is a no left bully can't even laugh as a courtesy. Like. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Richie. All right, well, thank you so much for coming, Alex. Really appreciate it. Right, my pleasure. Thank you, Richie. Thank you, Sam. Thank everyone. Bye. Bye. Alex, you can say bye. Oh, well, bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, that was so sad. A little enthusiasm, Alex. No, goodbye, everybody. Oh, God, it's this thing. No, just... What's happening? It's the stupid flying thing, but... Oh, no. You can only hit, like, during a certain part of its oh, pattern, it's and then thing, yeah. the thing that killed me last time. Watch your health. Watch I'm your watching health. my health! I hate this! <laughs> <laughs> you this game it, <laughs> makes me not want to believe in evolution, so I can say that nothing in this game ever happened. Sinclair Law is now a creationist channel. <laughs> Teach the controversy. <laughs> Evo never happened. <laughs> when they teach you in science class, there was a caveman who fought a cockroach for four hours because he couldn't hit it. <laughs> They're making that up. God put this game in my emulator to test us. Just thank God. Okay, I believe in God now. Right, it's dead. Did we finish the game? Yes. Well, I finished it. Yay! Good job, Richie. We never done. Okay, time for this Evo speed run. 
two minutes and 44. No, the other thing, 244. Two hours. <laughs> okay. Bravo. Thank God. Wow. Okay, apologize for anyone we may have offended with our comments. 